Science faction is for adults only and sexually abused child television stars. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 251, Science Faction Scatology. The study of uh, no, that's uh, jazzology, Damien. We've covered that before. Uh, no, this is scatology or coprology, which is the study of feces, which I actually expected you to be much more well versed in. I actually, I, I was making the noise that I make when I go oh, okay. feces when I when I my bowels move as you're studying feces, you just happily scatting along. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a character actor. So sometimes this is a medical field, which means you are actually looking at you know human feces. You're looking at them for issues of diet or disease or something like that. You're, sometimes you're it's a pornographic field. Yes, exactly. So, it's frequently a <laughs> pornographic field, especially depending on what country you come from. Sometimes it's a veterinary field where you're looking at something like the poo that comes out of the cow or dog or something a lot of times actually in the veterinary fields scatology could be the way that you study something that's very important to that animal's health because unlike in human fields and human medicine you can't just ask them what's wrong you can't ask them what hurts or ask them what's going on so looking at their feces is actually a really good indication of what might be wrong with that particular creature oh i thought like you could taste the feces and then know what was wrong with them like oh that's a sore elbow <laughs> It's because that horse is super hot. <laughs> Wait, there's two things wrong with that. <laughs> and sometimes for paleontologists, it tells us about the past. So not only can paleontologists uh, look at the coprolites from fossilized dinosaur stuff and tell us stuff about that dinosaur, tell us about maybe what they were eating and there are some bits of their lifestyle that we couldn't otherwise figure out based on their bones. But in the case of human paleontologists, we have things like the Paisley Cave coprolites in Oregon, which actually established, at least for a while, one of the earliest sites in the Americas. So we can look at human feces, fossilized human feces, and realize that, holy shit, quite literally, people were here way longer, way longer than we thought they were. At those Paisley Cave coprolite site, at uh -huh. that site when, when it first was discovered, was there a jurisdictional battle between the scatologist and the geologist? It's a rock. No, it's feces. <laughs> yeah. It's a feces rock. Well, technically, we're both right. All right. We'll have to work together on this. I have to warn you, though, you play by the book, but I'm a loose cannon, and I don't play by the rules. <laughs> He's like, wait a second. It's, it fits in both the paleontologist world and the geologist world, but old, also the shit world. What do we do? How do we combine this? I got it. Let's get a human paleontologist. From Germany. That'll work <laughs> out. Then it'll, we'll cross all those check boxes off the list. I was already here. Once I found out that there were copper lights, I, I took the first plane. It is good to hear that I am needed at this site. He's the Jeff Goldblum character from Independence Age. He's the scientist that gets transferred to wherever the poo action is going on. <laughs> Life finds a way. For paleontologists, looking at things like that scat can tell us a lot. Because remember, again, it's one step far further removed. So the same way the veterinary people can tell a lot from the poo because the animals can't talk to people. And so we can tell a little bit about the lifestyle that we can't see that's going on with them. Even more so with the paleontologists, looking at that fossilized poo can tell us stuff that we can't tell because we can't even observe the living animal itself. So when we see things like, oh, look, it's pooing near this den that it lives in or look at what's within this poo it turns out this is a vegetarian centered herbivore or look at the differences in poo that seems to accumulate in this riverbed valley that would indicate that it's winter time it looks like their diet shifts over the different times of year so indeed the less information you have about that particular creature be it because it can't talk to you or you can't even observe it the more important studying its poo actually is it's good to know that examining poo can have scientific purposes as well as just personal ones right yeah, yeah it's no longer just your hobby it can be your gig yes to put it quite simply yes they always say you should do what you love for work oh and speaking of doing what you love for work i of course am your host comedian archaeologist robert timothy and with me as always is my comedian and scatology expert mr damien mercado damien how you doing this afternoon i'm doing great and i think you just went on the record as calling me a scientist and not just a spiritual no i medium. said expert actually uh, you know well, I, I'm sorry, does expert, not, are you an archaeology expert? Dot, dot, dooty, dot, doo. And of course, our scientists <laughs> of the evening, Ian, Ian, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. 
<laughs> our representation <laughs> of scanning the musical style right. are terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep in mind we're white when we're doing this. If you can't tell, I already. am a proud Latino. Uh, and of course, you can go ahead and check out our website, www.thesciencefaction.com, for all the articles we cover here, as well as some we don't get to. And you can tweet us at Faction Science if you have an ungoogleable question for me, which we will get to later on in the show. We got a pretty good one this episode. But for now, we got some good articles. Let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Article number one, we've stopped aging in human cells. Are we Benjamin Buttoning now? Yeah, we're going back in time. No, no, no. We just stopped the actual aging of the cells. We haven't reversed them to a baby cell yet. Oh, that makes actually a lot more sense. Yeah, that might lead to the incident you talked about last week in which somebody might get chronic SIDS, where they continually (laughs) reverted to a baby and died, only to be revived and become an adult once again. I didn't see Benjamin Button. Is that how it ended? That is how it ended. Yes, that is... It's exactly how it works. With Kate Blanchett sobbing as an old lady with him in a crib. So when we talk about aging, we can talk about aging as individuals, as a thing that gets older. And, you know, we go through the periods of being an infant to being a child to being an adolescent to being an adult to being an older person, right? And that's our, the age of the actual individual. That's not the same thing as cellular aging, which we're going to discuss here. So cellular aging is the ability of that cell to continue to produce as it would when it is young. And we have something called senescence, which is basically that cell's inability to keep doing that. And basically cells become damaged over time and they have trouble replicating themselves or the replication itself gets damaged just like making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy at some point you're going to have some mistakes you're going to have some blurs you're going to have some image issues that happens when we re- replicate cells you know one c switch to a t switch to a g you know one little flip and all of a sudden maybe nothing happens right because maybe it's part of most of our dna that doesn't do anything maybe but you may- get superpowers maybe all of a sudden you get superpowers uh, to just be able to scat really well, <laughs> which clearly neither of us have gotten. That, that mutation hasn't happened to us yet. Ian? But then eventually, sometimes those uh, mistakes add up, and eventually that they actually have deleterious consequences. We've also talked before on a cellular level about telomeres, which are, again, think of your shoelaces. Think of those little plastic things at the end of your shoelaces that keep it from getting frayed. Those are like telomeres, and telomeres are on the end of your chromosomes, and they essentially keep everything nice and tidied up. And as those telomeres get shortened because of replication issues, again, the photocopy, the photocopy, the photocopy, we notice more and more aging, and we notice more and more mistakes. So intact telomeres usually are found in young cells, and the less intact telomeres in older cells are usually responsible for a lot of mistakes. So that's one part of cellular aging is telomeres. Also, the ability to replicate oneself over and over again without causing mistakes as part of, you know, kind of a young cell behavior. But as cells get older, they lose those abilities. And then as those misformed cells continue to replicate over and over again, we get more of those in our bodies. And eventually our bodies just get bad at doing basic things. You know, being an old person isn't just having hurt bones or old cuts or things like that. It's not saying the N-word in public. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. It's referring to Asian people as Asians, not Orientals. (laughs) It's walking dignified with shit in your pants. Right. As many scatologists do for part of their personal <laughs> research. Noob a dop, noob dop. <laughs> I'm just going to laugh every time you do it. But it's also more of your actual body gets worse at doing basic things. It gets worse at processing vitamins. It gets worse at being able to metabolize things. It gets worse at doing very basic parts of the functions that we expect a cell to do. And that just happens because over time those get bad at it. The question becomes, does it have to happen that way? Do we have to age the way we do? Can we get to a thing where somebody gets to 32, 33, and we start giving them a certain treatment, and their body stays at that same point indefinitely? I mean, theoretically, there's no reason they couldn't, right? There's no reason you couldn't get to a point where you are aging, and then if we understood the cellular mechanisms and how things work enough, basically stop you there. And you would continue to age chronologically, technically, but your body wouldn't necessarily have to age. You wouldn't have to get gray hairs. You wouldn't have to stop getting good at uh, metabolizing things. Your body wouldn't have to get weak. You wouldn't have to get osteoporosis. All of that is a result of the way our bodies are currently designed by evolution. It doesn't mean they have to be that way. And theoretically, if you knew all the mechanisms of the human body, how aging occurred, why it occurred, and you could manipulate those things, you could stop that and free somebody at 25, 26, 31. It's all the advantages of becoming a vampire and none of the disadvantages. Exactly. (laughs) 
Yeah, worst part about being a vampire, you never know if there's some like food on your face because you can't see yourself in the mirror. Like every time you go in, you're like, I don't know. I, just, uh. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, just constantly being afraid of sunlight. I mean, yeah, that too. I guess that's pretty bad. <laughs> you just carry one of those like parasol umbrellas around all the time. I noticed how neither of us said having to slaughter the innocent. You don't have to go for the innocent. Listen, I have a lot of enemies. Like, yeah. like it'll be a while before I'm slaughtering the innocent. I'm gonna be marking off my fucking list for a while. So what this group did was looking at how to freeze part of that aging process in vitro. So that means outside of the body, literally in glass. So this is them looking at manipulating human cells in certain ways to see if they can't stop that aging process. What they found is they could introduce hydrogen sulfide directly to the mitochondria that allow old cells to regain the dividing abilities of younger cells. So that senescence process whereby those older cells can't replicate as well. A lot of that has to do with the mitochondria, which we've discussed before. It's the powerhouse of the cell. It's essentially what fuels your cell. It's the motors behind it. And mitochondria have their own DNA. They have their own processes. They're actually the remnant of a separate creature getting kind of imbibed by another creature millions and millions and millions of years ago. So they have their own DNA and they kind of work on their own. They're the powerhouse that makes our cells work. And after a while, mitochondrial issues are part of aging. What they found is if they introduce this hydrogen sulfide right into that mitochondria, it seems to take these aged mitochondria and make them perform much more like the young mitochondria. And you can now have proper cell division that does not have the mistakes and issues we have with older cells. I'm going to go ahead and head off a lot of the questions we would receive on Twitter after this episode is released and ask it here. How do I DIY hydrogen sulfide in my own home into my own mitochondria? Uh, rotting eggs. I would say just eat a lot of rotten eggs. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's it? Yeah, well, it, but here's the problem. So that's just in your gut. It's not actually <laughs> getting directly to the mitochondria at that point. That is the issue. So How do I fix that issue? This is why I'm coming to the scientist. I'm not going to say that this is exactly what they studied, but I'm going to say just thinking about it off the top of my head, uh, eat more farts. Like that seems to be because you also you produce that as you fart. You know, you produce some of that methane stuff from that rotten egg. So you heard it here. Science faction says eat ass to stay young. <laughs> and you can tell that because the person who told you that dude is a <laughs> scatologist. <laughs> So how would this work, like Damien is saying, how would this work in vivo or in the actual body? How could you take this data, which is kind of abstract, and saying this is how it's done in a lab, and this is how we can affect it? How would you be able to use this to affect daily life? Well, the answer is, quite frankly, you can't right now. But could we do it in the future? The team of researchers that was working on it believes that the presence of the molecule in the mitochondria can increase the proteins that essentially switch genes on and off in response to environmental changes. So there's about 300 proteins in this group, and their numbers tend to decline as we age. If we can induce this in, maybe we can keep that decline from happening. The hydrogen sulfide seems to boost the amount of two of these splicing factors connected to the senescence. So basically, if we can introduce it directly to the cells in the body, what they're thinking is those two factors would allow us to not have that decline from those 300 plus proteins when we're young to fewer as we get older actually introducing them to the cells of our body is the hard part, right? Because even if you just bathed in rotten egg smell all day long, like Damien's apartment, like n <laughs> that still in and of itself probably would not introduce it directly to your cells. So the question becomes, can we use some kind of treatment, almost like vitamin treatment that you could imbibe and that your body would uptake and therefore would affect those cells directly? Right now, we don't have that. We don't have, we can't say like, yeah, eat papayas, you'll get hydrogen sulfide into your body. Could you inject rotten eggs into your body? That sounds probably like the safest way to do it. <laughs> With an enema. <laughs> right. So some ideas to think about. One is, again, we're just looking at this in vitro. We don't know how we would get this to the body just yet. But two is, they might also have negative side effects. Like we've talked about before, and we're about to talk about with the next article, we always have the issues of cancer. You know, the more cell divisions you have, the more likely you are to have a mistake that would cause cancer. So therefore, maybe that kind of aging, the decline in your ability to reproduce cells as you get older, is actually a bonus because you are doing less cellular reproduction, meaning you have less chances to have cancer where basically one of those cells gets copied wrong and grows out of control. Maybe that ability to not grow cells really well is actually in the benefit the older you get to keep you from getting cancer. So it's not necessarily just a good thing if you can solve this issue. Sooner or later, on a long enough timeline, any creature dies of cancer. So if we replicate those things better, maybe we'll all of a sudden have people looking really young, looking like they're 35 years old, but everybody dies at 55 because they have out of control cancer growth. I, I would say that's surrendering to the terrorists and the terrorists being cancer in this uh -huh. case. 
is it would be to not obtain immortality just for fear of getting cancer. If everybody gets it anyway. Right. I mean, well, I mean, cancer is kind of a form of immortality. It's just not a very pleasant one. Well, no, it's not. It's only a form of immortality if that cancer somehow leaps out of your body, Henrietta Lack style, yeah. <laughs> and gets into somebody well, else. You know, for the most part, cancer, it's not a form of immortality. It dies when you die. Well, I mean, if your cancer was legendary in a way that would be recorded by the Guinness Book of World Records, you could argue right. that your cancer has made you immortal. Yeah, like if it's like famous or if it's infamous. Like if your cancer killed Nicole Brown, you know, like in a <laughs> brutal fashion, you know, it could be an infamous cancer. OJ just said, I told you! I told <laughs> as, all of you! Just a small melanoma tumor wearing a little leather glove. <laughs> <laughs> but it also brings some other issues. So let's say we could do this. Let's say you could fix this in essence. You can fix aging. We could give you a shot at a certain age, 26, 27, 28, whatever it is. Your body stops aging. You stay that age for the rest of your life, which lasts essentially indefinitely as long as you don't die from from a car accident or something like that, and you keep yourself in good health. So at that point, we now have a bunch of immortals. This is a question we brought up a few times on this podcast. Is that ethical? Because the fact of the matter is that would lead to instant overpopulation. The only way the world can suffice to produce food and room and resources for the amount of people we have on Earth is if people continue to die. If we suddenly made a shot or an injection or a pill that gave you not even immortal life, let's say it added 100 years to your lifespan, we would instantly have an overpopulation problem, even worse than the overpopulation problem we currently have. We would have one that would cause millions and millions of people to die of famine and water loss and stuff. Is it ethical? Is it ethical to give somebody a longer lifespan? Or do we have the ethical obligation to die so that the next generation has room to go do their shit? I say yes, because this procedure isn't ready yet. But yes, if you're willing to colonize Mars or any other space colony that is up by then, Mm -hmm. like, yes, your chances of dying go up exponentially. But hey, you make it, you're immortal. It also kind of leaves an interesting point. I mean, a lot of space travel at this point is out of reach just because of the time that it takes to get anywhere. Okay. So you give people essentially immortal lifespans and send them out to go colonize other planets. Because those planets' resources don't factor into the equation. So send them out. You might as well do that. That's an interesting way to go. I would think that if you did it, you would have to do something where, okay, yes, you're technically immortal. But there has to be a way that we can still weed you out so that you can't be, like, immortal forever. You're immortal, but then... It's called a bullet. Like, it's No, still well, no, I was thinking, you couldn't just have a bullet because then random stray shootings and stuff could hurt people. So, like, what if you had to, like, separate the head from the body of a person <laughs> in order Are to end like their Futurama mortality? Here? <laughs> we were talking Highlanders yes. there. Yes. I might be referencing a documentary made in the late 80s, including Sean Connery. There there could only be one space colonizer. (laughs) That's one way to handle the problem. Every time we talk about life extension, I always think about this, is do we really have an ethical mandate to die? And that in extending people's lives and extending the end part of people's lives, we are actually harming the younger generation that then doesn't get that room, those resources. Uh, If you make people healthy so they're 30 years old until they're 100 or something like that, they have the body of a 30-year-old until they're 100, Well, then you're not retiring at 55, right? You're probably still working. Are you then occupying parts in the workforce that we need kids to grow up and do? And are we talking about baby boomers now or anybody like literally anybody? It seems like we're screwing up the system. It's weird because we always talk about having a better life or helping people live longer, live healthier. But every time I hear that, I always think the counter side to that is you're taking somebody else's spot. Like there's a spot on the roster that belongs to some kid who was just born. You're staying there longer than you're. But you're essentially Van Wildering life. Like you're I, staying too oh, long. Oh wow! I didn't. I, now that I now that I think about that movie, like some kid didn't get an acceptance letter yeah, in right. college because Van Wilder couldn't get his shit together. That's right. a whole new dimension. I think if you become this immortal person, you either have to live in the middle of Antarctica or the Sahara. So you, if, you go to a less desirable place. If you are immortal, and then you have to build your society there. And not just less desirable, but a a spot that's currently not occupied. Right. But you would still need resources, right? So you'd still be taking fuel or food or... Well, that, that would be part of the weeding out process. Okay. If you can't sustain yourself there. I like the idea that we turn places like the Sahara or Antarctica into modern day penal Australia. You're like, uh, you're not a criminal, but you're alive too long. So just go over there and, you know, develop your own weird kangaroo culture. The joke was on all of you, though, because as the world continued to heat up, Antar- the Arctic became prime beachfront ter- territory. They're sitting in the new Malibu. All right, on to article number two, elephants and their cancer. 
We've covered before some interesting facts about elephants that they don't get cancer nearly as much as we would think. And there's a few reasons for this, but if you do the math on it, we talked about before, cancer is essentially a statistical thing. So a cell replicates every so often, and during that replication, so many mistakes just get made by statistical chance. If a specific mistake is made in terms of the parts of the cell, the mechanisms of the cell that keep it from growing out of control, then you get a single cell with cancer, that thing grows and you get cancer. That's basically how it is. Now it can happen just through standard replication. It can also happen if something happens like you're exposed to a carcinogen that, let's say sunlight, a specific bit of that sunlight hits the right part of your body and knocks out, especially if you don't have melanin like me, the exact right part of your DNA that keeps things from growing out of control and all of a sudden you get skin cancer. That's a really easy example. That can happen with ionizing radiation. It can happen with anything where you're essentially getting damaged to that one part. It can also just happen because that cell replicates. It happens to replicate wrong and that, that goes on. That means the larger your body size is and the longer you live, the more likely you are to get cancer. It also can come from being exposed to Roundup. No, it can't. <laughs> That's total myth. But um, <laughs> I thought we should take time to address that here on the show. Uh, That's science news. But elephants, which are both very large and very long-lived, don't tend to get cancer a lot. In fact, a study here at the San Diego Zoo found they get cancer about 4 to 11% of the time over a lifespan, where in human terms, we would expect about a 25% cancer rate. That's crazy, right? That means this thing that's bigger than us, that lives about as long as us, gets cancer less than us. Mathematically, that doesn't make sense. Now, we've known that fact for quite some time. It's a lot of reasons why. We've covered some of them on Science Faction before. But a real Cancer hates peanuts. Actually, I think it's because cancer travels in mice, and we all know about how the <laughs> elephant feels about mice. So. <laughs> So the question has always been, why is this? What are the cellular mechanisms behind it? And then obviously the follow-up, can we incorporate that into our own ability to fight cancer? Can we figure out a way to use whatever they have to stop it? Researchers were looking at elephants to see about genetic issues that might lead them to be predisposed to not have cancer. And we've covered some of those already here on the show. We're not going to delve all the way back into those. But a recent study looked at a particular gene called LIF6 that was somehow resurrected about 59 million years ago in the elephant lineage, meaning it was there before, it was in some creatures, and then it kind of got phased out, likely because it wasn't that useful, and then it suddenly came back, and this... Because 50, an elephant never forgets. That's right, they I never forget to... their genes to stop cancer. <laughs> we need to bring back Lift 6. It also never forgets how to make uh, music impromptu at any point. That do dee da do ba I'm just going to show myself out now. <laughs> we're going we're to scat for you on the way. Their first album, Covered in Elephant Scat, was not nearly what we were trying to convey. Doing an elephant, using his nose as a horn. As a saxophone, yeah. yeah. With, with glasses and a top hat and a very large suit. So about 59 million years ago, that's when we see the elephant's ancestors start to increase in size. Not all elephants were big. And back then, they were just kind of a, a pachyderms were these much smaller creatures. And they, as they started to increase in size and become the things we know that are not only modern-day African and Asian elephants, but woolly mammoths and mastodons and all of those creatures, they, as they started to increase in size, this gene became more prevalent, this LIF6 gene, indicating that it probably has something to do with combating that cancer and letting them live long enough. So what happens is LIF6 is triggered by another gene, TP53, which essentially puts cells out of commission at the first sign of damage before they turn cancerous. This is a really good first detection system. Basically, these genes regulate a system whereby they immediately seek out and destroy any cell that is out of place. Think of it like this. I like to think about it like they have a school system with really astute and powerful bullies. Like, and anytime they see a kid that's slightly out of play, like, hey, what are you doing with those fucking glasses on, kid? They just go and they rough him up until he is so distraught he either kills himself or leaves the school. And that is how the elephants fight cancer at a much more efficient rate than we do. That's a very disturbing analogy. It is, and yet, I'm just saying, and I'm not, I'm not saying what we should do or shouldn't do, but maybe, maybe we need to start arming the bullies. Maybe if we arm the bullies in our high schools and middle schools, <laughs> we would have a less cancer-filled society. Causation correlation. You basically described Japanese school, primary and secondary school, right? Mm -hmm. Is it that the, the professors assume the role of educator and bully, and That's they're right. allowed to beat you for getting out of line? Yeah, or not picking up trash or anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to conform. And if you're not the exact confirmation to everybody else, then you get kicked out. Our bodies, we allow too much diversity. That's the problem. We're like, oh, hey, everybody's doing their own thing. We have a Montessori education fucking yeah. system going We got here. like some beatniks. They're all wearing fucking fedoras and it's a school. It's horrible. 
My cells are getting a S plus on their fucking report card. So the question becomes: what the Is there an S plus? <laughs> it's a non grade. <laughs> <laughs> something that makes me feel better about my failures. Class, your grades today include a happy face, two stars, some pancakes, and uh, this one doesn't actually have a written form, but we'll just call it. <laughs> this is better than maze. <laughs> Now, we have to ask ourselves, is there a downside to this? Is there a downside to clearing that, uh, that out? Now, one of them is just the metabolistic constraints of having an overactive you know, cellular mechanism, meaning we would, it would cost us energy to do that. Now, in our modern-day society, especially the modern-day first world, we're not hurting for personal cellular energy. In fact, most of us has too many of it, and we store it as fat. So that particular downside probably would not be too big on us. We're not starving to death, so that uptake in energy that would cost us to be you know, a little bit stricter on regulating our, our cellular stuff would not be that big a deal. But the question would become, maybe this would have a bad effect elsewhere in terms of, you know what? Yeah, it's taking out all the cancerous cells, but it also is going after anything that looks slightly different. So it's taking out these uh, neural development cells that allow our brain to have neuroplasticity. And therefore, you know, the same thing that's fighting cancer would also keep us from repairing our brain from injuries or something else. So, so there's, wait, wait, wait. there's always a... that elephants can't repair their brain? I don't injury? know. We don't know. These type of studies are the follow-ups that we would need to be able to say, hey, look, this is a safe mechanism that maybe through genetic engineering, through some CRISPR, through something, we can adopt ourselves and therefore cut down our lifetime cancer risk. And maybe it's something where there is a huge negative side effect that we don't realize that maybe doesn't affect elephants or it's not that important to them because they don't have the same brain style we do. Maybe it's there's something in there that ends up being bad news over the long run, but maybe not. And maybe this is the type of thing that you would choose to genetically engineer your kid to have. You know, we're one generation away from most kids, I would say, being genetically engineered, or at least most kids in the first world. Whether that's to the extent of, I want them to not have Huntington's disease, and so therefore we make sure all the kids with Huntington's disease get some kind of genetic treatment so it doesn't happen or they're never born, or I want a girl or a boy or blue eyes or something like that. There might also be these little things. Hey, do you want to give your kid essentially a guaranteed no cancer risk for the first 80 years of his life? But the downside might be that if he gets paralyzed in a motorcycle accident, he's never going to walk again. Well, to be fair, I, I think that happens today. Like, I'm pretty it sure does, but some I, people, as somebody without some, some elephant genes in me, if I got paralyzed today. As accident. we've covered before, because of neuroplasticity, while that does happen, it also happens that a lot of times when people do get brain injuries or something like that, they, the brain finds a way around it because of that neuroplasticity city effect. I want to see some elephants in some motorcycle accidents and see how well they recover. I'm not convinced that elephants can't recover at the same rate that we can, which is, by the way, terrible. We have terrible spinal recovery. That is I just true. want to point out that there aren't any elephant motorcycle gangs, and so I don't think there's a high prevalence of them riding motorcycles. Oh, you just pissed off the Vishnus. Oh, man. <laughs> I wouldn't want to drive home with you today. So I'm picturing a scientist who has to give an elephant CTE, you know, goes up on like one of those mechanical lifts, just has like the a sledgehammer. Yeah, sledgehammer. <laughs> This also ties into something called pedo's paradox, which is really interesting, which is we found out that rats, even though they're much smaller than us and live much shorter lifespans, they get cancer at about the same rate that human beings do. It's one of the reasons they're a good test for certain cancer drugs or certain cancer procedures. However, we wouldn't expect that, remember? Just like we talked about before, lifespan times body size is going to be your cancer risk, and so it seems weird that that would happen. Well, maybe this is part of that explanation. Maybe as larger animals grow larger, they get inherent cellular mechanisms that help them fight off things. So maybe if we look at the difference between us and rats, we'd find something similar to this LIF6. So I would actually argue it's sort of backwards from what you said. Mm. In order for an animal to grow larger, they would actually have to yes. have these mechanisms in place. Otherwise, if they get larger, they're right. going to get cancer. Right, yeah. So it would be a, a standard natural selection model, right? Like as they're growing larger and larger, those with the mechanisms to deal with the expanded cancer would, would then be more reproductively successful. Now, exactly. the, the hard part with cancer is most of the time cancer is hitting you after your reproductive years. And so because of that, you know, a lot of times it's not going to be affected in, in that model, in a natural selection model. If cancer kills you long after you've had kids that are also reproducing themselves, it doesn't really affect natural selection that much. That's one of the things about old age diseases. Once you're past your breeding prime, natural selection doesn't give a fuck about you. That's, that's cold. It's probably why we care a lot more about childhood leukemia and stuff. Like they never got to bone. I mean, actually, the, really, it's just nature doesn't give a fuck about you. That's absolutely true. And then again, this brings up the same question we just talked about in the last article. Would it even be ethical? Maybe we have an ethical responsibility to get cancer by the time we're 85 so that we stop fucking taking up so much goddamn space with our Werther's original. 
and making America great again. Exactly. All right, let's move right on to our favorite new bit. Ask Bobby an ungoogleable question. I find the premise of what you said factually untrue because as I believe everybody's favorite bit is I call BS or Damien summons a dead scientist. That's true. I call BS. You're right. Is everybody's favorite. It's It's our favorite. It's definitely not Damien summons a dead scientist. No, nobody thinks that. Nobody? No. In fact, uh, we did have a British fan call it rubbish. Yes, <laughs> on I, Twitter, she was, it was really harsh for her. <laughs> she actually got banned from British Twitter for using such profanities. Sexist. It was a male. Yeah. All right. So the ungoogleable question we got this time: As science has evolved over time, we've seen the refinement of it from better controls to peer review. What is the future evolution of science? This is a really good question because it took me a second to think about. It. I was like, oh, we have it. Scientific method is always scientific method. And I thought back and I was like, no, 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 this person's right. They actually are correct. We have gotten much better. We got better at controls. We talked about this last week with parapsychology. We've gotten better at setting up experiments. We've gotten better at things like peer review, at not just taking one particular study and and deciding that that's canon in science. We've gotten pretty darn good, and we're getting better by the day. What's the future of it? Where will we see it go? How will it get better and uh, continually improve upon itself? So I got some interesting answers, but first I want to hear what you guys think. So Damien, uh, what do you think is the future of the evolution of science? I think robot girlfriends for scientists. Yes, that's almost happening now. Well, I mean, I like think realistic, it is in Japan. Yeah, yeah, they actually look like anime. Uh-huh. Like that's <laughs> they have nunchuck skills. Are we talking about like on Archer? They beat up bullies. Yeah, yes, <laughs> they're like it's a uh, Krieger. Yeah, fucking. Krieger. <laughs> All right, Japanese girlfriend robot, do the only thing I desire: scat for me. Scat <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, that your German accent? Yeah, I, I'm not the accent guy. All right. And, and you know what? I have to imagine most Germans are scatologists or at least casual scatologists. Yes, and to thank you very much. I was actually doing the impression of a German scientist who threw, threw the axis of evil alliance back in the 40s, <laughs> had been living in Japan for... You know what? Never mind. <laughs> All right, Ian, where do you, what do you think the future of uh, the evolution of science will be? So I think... Uh, and there's... We're already starting to do this in a lot of ways, Um, and it's sort of the citizen science or democratization of science where non-professional scientists are able to go out, you know, not necessarily do research, but at least collect data. Yep. One of the things I really see helping this is the advance of the technology, particularly in the cell phone. So if you think of, you know, if there's tools or applications that we can build into a cell phone that then help people collect data. Yeah. Then, if you have, let's say, a thermometer in everybody's cell phone, you can tell temperature data much better because you could take an average of everybody. So you wouldn't just say, hey, it's 75 degrees in San Diego. You could take averages of microclimates in different areas. Exactly. And another thing that I was thinking would be really neat. So there's a, just to give a little shout out, there's a project uh, called the Reef Project. And they do things where uh, they can train citizens to identify fish. And mm-hmm. then after you... Uh, get a certain qualification you can then go out and when you go swimming or diving or snorkeling you can do fish studies yeah if you imagine building this technology into a camera or something like that that you can take with you and we can start using ai to identify fish so now you don't have to go through these classes and everything to identify fish now you just have to bring your camera and suddenly everybody can start collecting data And that can even go one step further because I know uh, in the scuba community, there are people, for instance, the lionfish is this horribly invasive fish that's just basically destroying a lot of areas, including ours. And it tastes delicious. Yeah. And what they do is they train these guys who run scuba tours to know what they look like and they have them kill them. You know, they go out with the little Hawaiian sling or something and they take them out. And it's really, really good for the environment just to have these regular people. They're not scientists. They're just the guys who are in the water every day. Train them what these things look like. Give them a Hawaiian sling and let them kill these things. Very good answer. I thought a lot about this. I was wondering, like, yeah, where is the future of science going? So there's a few things that I think about. So one is, let's start by defining science. One is science is a process. It's not a thing. It's not a canon of knowledge. It's a, it's a process for investigating the world around us to tell what is true or most likely true and what is not. So starting with that, the first thing we need to do is better define science to the general public. Because w- the way the general public thinks of science now is almost the way they think of religion. They, you'll hear people say, science says this, or science tells us this. Science doesn't do either of those things. Science is a process which we follow 
to try and ascertain the best knowledge possible. And the second we stop thinking about it as some deistic overarching thing, the way we used to think of the Bible, it says this, it tells us this, and start thinking of it as a process we go through to get something. It's no different than washing the dishes. Washing the dishes doesn't tell us anything. It's the process we go through to get clean dishes, right? So the second we kind of inform the public better about what science itself is, I think we'll have better results because then people are more likely to accept the fact that it changes. You get new information. You get contradictory information. You improve the information you currently have. Butter is good for you. Butter is bad for you. Butter is back. Coffee good. good. Coffee. Yeah, exactly. Same thing. Number two, this is a big one. I think in the immediate future, we really do need to address and fix the replication crisis. We've talked about this a little bit on the show before. The replication crisis started in psychology, where we started looking at a bunch of psycho psychological studies, including really famous ones, Milgram, a bunch of others, and finding that we can't replicate them. They might be total BS, not necessarily due to fraud. Some of them are probably fraud, but very few. A lot of them might be the publication bias, just the fact that most levels of surety are about 0.05, meaning we'd expect uh, these results uh, don't actually show us anything. It's just there's a 5% chance. It's just random chance that you would get these otherwise extreme results. Well, if only certain people publish and those things get attention, then those we'd expect that 5% of all things should be wrong anyway. And that gets expounded to maybe 10, 50%, something like that, based on publication bias. So we have basically found that a lot of what we had considered settled science is not. And we're going back and finding that this is not just in psychology. It's in physics. It's in... It's parapsychology. In, it's a parapsychology. It's in basically everything except math. We're finding that there is this huge issue of being unable to replicate things. That needs to be addressed immediately. And the only way it can be addressed is for us to do more and more replication studies. And the only way to do that is to start encouraging graduate students and tell them, hey, guess what? We know it's really romantic to go do new studies and go try a new thing every single time. And that's what universities want to hire you. But guess what? We really need you to double check this guy's work. We need you to replicate this other experiment that was done in Croatia and see if you get the same results. And the fact that we're not doing that is a huge problem in science right now. We need more replication studies. And as hard as this is to swallow, less novel new studies. So that's a big one. Number three, we need larger sample sizes. Over and over again, we've talked about on this show, we will look at Just major the public... the girth or the length? Yeah, or... yeah, well, yeah, you, you know what they say, you, girth is more important in sample sizes. <laughs> they do say that. We need bigger sample sizes, man. A lot of times, some of this research is done with 20, 30 people because those are the undergrads they could get at the time, and it's a narrow select set. We need bigger, wider sample sizes. I think that has a lot to do with what Ian was talking about, about public science and public involvement and education in science. We need your everyday people being involved in this type of research. And it can't just be university psychology undergrads. That can't be our, the constant group we use to determine the reality of the world around us. So we need larger sample sizes. We need predictive test constraints with mandatory pre and post experiment publishing, meaning instead of just saying, okay, well, here's what I'd like to do. Do the experiment, write it up, see if you can get it published based on some results you have now seen or some correlation you see cherry picking that data. Instead, we need a system whereby, and this exists to some extent now, it's new, but it's expanding. If I want to do an experiment, I first submit to the journal and say, this is the experiment I want to do. Here's my setup, everything. Here's how I'm going to do it. They say, okay, go ahead. I do it. And then even if I get no results or negative results or it doesn't work out, I still publish the results. That keeps the publication bias from only being things that seem to get a reaction, and that will put our certainty way up. It essentially is a check on you. It says, here's what I want to do. I did it. Here are the results. That information becomes publicly available to everyone, so if somebody else wants to do a similar test, they can look back at your results. They can see if they can replicate it or try a different tactic, and also it keeps us all honest and says, we're not just going to publish the sensational stuff we see, thereby giving a biased sample to what becomes the scientific canon. I think it's also, you touched on an important point, is the publication or recognition of negative results. Yes, huge. And that's part of the publication bias. We don't publish those enough because they're not getting anybody tenure. And the problem is those are still results that are important to the overall thing. Because let's say 100 people did a study and they did essentially the same study, but we're unaware of it. And 5% of them got crazy results. Well, that's what we would expect with a p-value of 0.05. We would expect that 5% got results that were just because of the way statistics work, that they made it look like something was going on, but there was nothing going on. Well, if the other 95 don't publish because they didn't get any results and those five do, then it looks like we got something going on when we don't. Well, and, just, and more than that, I think it also has to do with the efficiency of the process. If you have 100 people doing the same experiment, that's 
a waste if 95% of them are going to get negative results. If you, you know, it's not a waste if all that information is collected and aggregated and you can use that as a meta study. I, I would argue if they're all doing the same experiment and, but we do need, that's the point. We need replication though. Well, right? Okay. Let's say the first 10 yeah. do the experiment. All 10 get negative results. Right. There's no reason I don't think that the next 90 should go and you're repeat probably right. that. Yeah, you're probably right. Given good sample sizes and controls and everything. Offhand, I have, I have a couple of suggestions. One, you institute a um, pro bono. Like, you know how lawyers have to do a certain amount of pro bono work every year? Uh-huh. Well, a certain amount of every scientist has to do a certain amount of replication work every. Oh, year. I it's like called that. grad school. Yeah, no, 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 no. The problem with grad school is too many people are trying to do novel stuff. I like that idea. Or you find a way to compensate scientists on how many experiments they run per year, per whatever. That way, they're just knocking out replication studies, just doing it all the time, as opposed to like coming out with one gambling on one novel idea that yeah. might win them a patent or get them notoriety or whatever. Another possibility, I think we need to do better at specifying when in science, and we need to do better at identifying areas to specify. So we talked before about how literally in the last three years, all of a sudden, researchers are like, oh, shit, all of these medical results, these like drug studies, they're all tainted by the fact that we didn't segregate men and women. And so uh, the results that we would have gotten if we had are now muddled in together because we didn't separate those two people. And women have a different reaction. They have different body chemistry than men. And we didn't do that. We need to start specifying and identifying areas that we need to specify we didn't even think about before because those will change the overall results and we'll get better information if we do. We also need to make almost, I think this is a big one. We need to make all research publicly available. Too much of that stuff is behind paywalls. Too much of that stuff is only accessible if you have the right university codes. Science as part of the process is supposed to be public because part of this process of science, if you sit in a cave and quote unquote do science, you're not actually doing it. It has to be publicly available so other people can check your results and then expand on that research. If this stuff is not publicly available and accessible to the public in some form, then it's not real science and it's not getting us any further along. I think we are actually doing better on that. We There's are. a lot of open source journals. Yeah, PubMed plus one, all that stuff. But it's not all of them. And what I would really like to see, quite frankly, is somebody, and actually people have gone to jail for this. There's, we covered one case where a guy went to jail. Somebody going back into all the journals and publishing the stuff open source. Is PNAS publicly available? It is. So I could just get PNAS anytime you I want. You can get PNAS whenever you like, Damien. That's good. It's good to know publication of the National Academy of Sciences, of course. Also, we need better science communication because dissemination of that information is part of the process. If we're doing it and nobody is figuring out, not only can they not do more research on it, but it's not helping society in general. So part of that science is going to be the interaction. We can't just think of scientists as these people who are off doing their thing like priests in a cave somewhere. We actually have to get that information to the people that Scientists it are molesting boys? Yeah. <laughs> In a cave. We also are going to have to report it. We're going to have more and more ethical issues, things like ethical questions about genetic engineering of future generations, like we just talked about, and the ethical implications of certain sciences themselves. Ethics are going to be a big part of the future of science as they continually exchange. I mean, you can't do the Milgram experiment over again in 2018. You just couldn't because we have different ethical standards. Not people are going to look America. Ba- <laughs> people are going to look back at us in 20, 30, 50 years and think the same thing about some of the stuff we're doing now. So the evolution of ethics side by side with science and the evolution of scientific ethics is going to be a big direction that that shapes where science goes. We're going to have a lot more cooperation across borders. Right now, if you want to look at almost all the published research, it comes out of like five places. It's the United States, China, Japan, Germany. Mexico. No, not Mexico. But like, it really, it comes out of very localized spots. And that's not going to be the case in 50 years. We're going to have a lot of people who are able to conduct this research because of the ability of computers and, and other stuff across borders. And that's going to be a big thing. International cooperative communities is going to be a big thing. But lastly, and I think the thing that's going to cause most of the difference is going to be AI. Once you have artificial intelligence, especially powerful artificial intelligence, getting involved in this, you're not going to necessarily even have to do all the experiments in real life. A lot of it can be simulated with the proper AI protocols, meaning they can say, uh, hey, let's create a a simulated universe and do everything the way our universe would react and then see what the reactions are here, here, and here. You're going to have AIs that are going to be able to come up with much better experiments, ask much better questions than we can. You're going to have AIs that are going to be able to compute data much faster, put these together. I mean, think of, execute, and quantify results in a tenth of a second of large-scale studies that would take us years and years and millions and millions of dollars. The AI scientists will be around in our lifetimes. We will see that, and they will beat us. 
they will be better than us. They will be able to see the flaws in our reasoning, see the problems with our experimental research design. They'll be able to do things we couldn't possibly do and look at parts of the data we couldn't look at because they'll be able to look at a thousand variants of that data in a second and compare them all and, and extrapolate what those different parts of data mean. So just to follow up on that, this actually is already happening in certain fields, um, such as drug discovery. There are artificial intelligence algorithms being used to develop new and novel drugs that right. Have if we put an OH group before. on here, what happens? Yeah. Yeah. No, they'll never take scatology from us. So I think that is the biggest one. Once we have AI, much like it'll change our workforce, our culture, our society, and eventually it'll take over and dominate our children's generations. AI will change the way we do science. I know one, it's not uh, going to help us that much against the machines, but we basically talked about eugenics earlier this episode. Wouldn't breeding hyper-intelligent children at least put off the AI overtaking us nah. by maybe like 10 years nah, or something? they got us either way. If they're going to get smarter and smarter so exponentially fast, it would be a 10-minute span of time if we're lucky. This is even after the impl- implementation of your prostitutes for good grades it program? It wasn't a prostitute for a good grade. It was where you took the hottest girl in the senior <laughs> class behind you who wasn't going off to school, the one that, th- that was going to go work at a job bagging groceries, and then you took the now empty libraries because nobody reads books anymore and you used it as a place where she gave hand jobs to all the kids in the grades bef- below her who got A's. First of all, it was a great social program. Yeah, how and we, would, to be to fucking... we would beat out China in math in a year and a half if we <laughs> implemented it. I'm very confused. So, uh, Ian, imagine this. I, I solved a bunch of problems, right? Libraries are almost this, useless. This is just hypothetical, right? You haven't tried this? Well. Not in America. <laughs> uh, so, listen, libraries are getting useless, right? We got Kindles and e-readers and stuff. We don't need gigantic rooms filled with books anymore. So, what are we going to do with these rooms? Well, we also have a problem where we're getting beaten by other countries in terms of math and science grades. So, what if... Think about this. There's always a few girls who are very, very attractive, cheerleaders or whatever, who aren't going off to college. They're not going to do anything with their life. But they have a lot of social currency. Everybody looks up, oh, my God, that's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. That's the girl who's two classes above me, and she's the hottest girl, the most popular girl in school. You take some of those girls, and you give them a very well-paying job, great benefits, the whole nine yards, and their entire job is to fawn over and maybe occasionally, if you're doing really well, give an HJ to anybody who gets straight A's. That would then take all the kids at the lower levels who are like, before, they're just like, oh, I want to make sure my parents are happy or I want to get into a good school. Now they're like, I will kill a motherfucker if you get close to my extra credit project. (laughs) And they will do whatever it takes. They will have calculus majors in the 10th grade if we (laughs) implement this system. And I'm not talking about in 15 years, 20 years. Tomorrow, tomorrow, kids will be taking up advanced (laughs) mathematics. This would change society overnight. And all we do is get rid of buildings we don't need anymore, give jobs to young women who would otherwise have subpar jobs. And let's be honest, they'd be given those hand jobs anyway. They'd just be the more losers. And all of a sudden, the nerdy kids finally get a reward. And we take the kids who are halfway in the middle and make them strive to be the nerds. I would completely change society in, eh, I'll give it six months. Way more beneficial to the education system than the guidance counselor, the yes. counselor, the vice principal, yes. fuck, even the principal. You know what? Their offices, they're now the satellite hand job office. That's what that's <laughs> the guidance counselor office. <laughs> so wait, now now the principal's giving out hand jobs? But no, 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 no. That's just for the other hot chicks. Like when, when they when you get, I want to walk all the way to the library. It's a progress report, not a full on report card. <laughs> The, the principal is essentially the manager for the hand job specialist. Yeah. Essentially, his job is to make sure the booths are filled. That's people show up to work on time. <laughs> payroll works. Yeah, take my word on that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 251, where you learned about scatology. How we might have reversed cellular aging in humans. Why elephants don't get cancer and what the future of science will be. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 252. And now, German scat porn. Penis, cock, balls, zappadoodoo. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.